Good morning. Welcome again to an incredible opportunity to share wisdom with a new panel. This is our last gathering together. An opportunity to speak about building compassion in our children and their spirituality. I want to thank all of you for being so wonderful and patient as we went through this process and coming to share your visit, your time here with us. I also want to just thank a couple of people before we start, starting with my family, who has supported this program so well, Sally and Kara and Caitlin. And the Selig family for sponsoring this event and all of those who've helped. Over 1,500 volunteers have given their heart to be here to help make this happen. You're wonderful. Thank you. And now we hear the wonderful voice of a very, very special man who's going to start us off with the spirit that we need to carry this conversation. Sheikh Tijani. The most gracious, compassionate one. He taught compassion. He taught inspiration and the revelation of divine compassion. And then he created man and gave him, out of his compassion, intelligence and speech. So that he could see and perceive through meditation and contemplation that the sun and the moon are all moving at peace on its own axis according to the decreed direction. And for him to understand that out of the compassion of the supreme being, even the multitudes of the galaxies, 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 all bow down to the principles and the beauty of compassion. And the earth, he said it's so vast and made it for the entire creation to enjoy without distinction, without separation, without superiority complexities or inferiority complexities. And the heavens, he raised them so high and set the balance so that no one, none of his creation can exceed the balance. We are obligated to submit ourselves to this justice. And there can be no justice without compassion. We all are seeds of compassion. So I say, brethren, the family, human family, who are gathered here, help me to sing the songs of compassion. Shall we all rise up? It goes like this. We are the seeds of compassion, and we are ready to sow seeds of compassion right now. We are the seeds of compassion we're ready to sow seeds of compassion right now come on we are the seeds of compassion we're ready to sow seeds of compassion right now we are the seed of compassion we're ready to sow the seeds of compassion right now 
We are the seeds of sheen. We're ready to sow seeds of compassion right now. From Africa, from America, from the Europe, from Asia, from Tibet, China, Middle East, America, South America, South Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, and all over the world. We are the seeds of compassion. We're ready to sow seeds of compassion right now. Through His Holiness, the Honorable Dalai Lama, whom I love so much, through His oh Holiness, the Archbishop, Desmond Tutu of my Africa, and through my beloved sister, Ingrid Matheson of the Muslims of America, and through my beautiful Jewish rabbi, and through my Sikh brother, we are the seeds of compassion. Yeah, yeah. We're ready to sow the seeds of compassion right now. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. God bless you, sir. Africa's waiting for you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Robert Taylor, and welcome. Wait here, I'll get you a bottle. I'll go get you one. They always say it's uh, not a good idea to follow someone with such a magnificent voice. Thank you for that. Earlier this morning, as we began this fifth and final day of the Seeds of Compassion event, some of us gathered for a prayer breakfast. And there were over 17 different spiritual and faith traditions present at that breakfast this morning. And I suspect that there are an even greater number represented here today. And in the spirit of this gathering, we would like to present on behalf of the more than 150,000 people who have been part of Seeds of Compassion over this past week. And on behalf of the city of Seattle, we would like to present to His Holiness the Dalai Lama a prayer wheel. And the artist of that prayer wheel Chris Mensch is unveiling it now. Chris. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Before introducing Roshi Joan Halifax, I'd like to express on behalf of all of us our deep appreciation and thanks to Dan Kranzler for his single-minded vision and inspiration. Dan, where are you? Thank you. 
Dan, wherever you are, <laughs> may you feel all of that from all of us. There he is. It is my great pleasure to introduce the moderator of this morning's session, Joan Halifax Roshi. She is a Buddhist teacher, Zen priest, anthropologist, and author. She is also founder, abbot, and head teacher at Upaya Zen Center, a Buddhist monastery in Santa Fe, New Mexico. She is also the founding teacher of the Zen Peacemaker Order and of the Upaya Prison Project that develops programs on mediation for prisoners. We are so thankful and grateful to have her as moderator of this morning's Interspiritual Day. Please join me in welcoming Joan Halifax Roshi. Thank you. Thank you. Your Holiness, Archbishop Tutu, distinguished panelists, young people. We are so grateful that all of us could come together today because it is a day where we can remember how deeply imperiled the world is and also that the future is, rests in not only the hands of those who are young, but also in the hands of those who are old and the decisions that we make in this day and on this day. We're also asked to remember that not only is the world imperiled, but traditions are imperiled, and most notably Tibet. We hold with His Holiness and the many, many friends of Tibet our hearts open and our prayers extending forth, that there can be some deep resolution to the situation in Tibet at this time. And in a few minutes, thank you. And in a few minutes, I'm going to ask us to come into collective silence and pray in whatever way is appropriate to us for the well-being and the best outcome the only outcome has to be the best outcome for the situation in Tibet. We have many people on this stage. And so our mandate has been to invite each person who is going to speak to go to essence. This is the only way that um, the extraordinary questions that have been posed by the young people to our panelists can be addressed. So I'm going to ask both support from our gathered friends here and also the panelists, should I make a, an undivine intervention? Uh, because your aria is too long. The real aria is going to come up at the end of the program um, so that we can um, have the opportunity to really explore the questions uh, in a diverse way. We have requisite variety here. We have many different perspectives and eyes through which we can look at some very important questions to young people. And so the panelists are going to take no longer than two and a half minutes to address uh, the question. And we will have two or three panelists and then His Holiness or the Archbishop uh, address those uh, questions that we're going to explore. So please uh, give us support to go to Essence. I wanted to uh, remind us of some important things that His Holiness has said about compassion, because these are key points for young people. Uh, in a certain uh, talk, he said, universal responsibility is the feeling for other people's suffering just as we feel our own. Universal responsibility is not something that is sectarian. It is something that every human being on this earth must attend to. And that attending to is based in the experience of loving kindness, of, 
compassion, and a fundamental altruism, the deep desire to really serve others. In another talk, His Holiness said, love and compassion are necessities, not luxuries. Love and compassion are necessities, not luxuries. Without them, the world cannot survive. And we need to take this to heart. And then these words are so well known that His Holiness has said, and we need to take these words to heart. My religion is kindness. My religion is kindness. His Holiness has articulated a vision of compassion which is um, referential or biased or has an object and an unbiased vision of compassion, which is universal. To actualize compassion means that we have to perceive suffering. And then when we perceive it, we must understand that it's not separate from our own life. We cannot objectify suffering. We have to know suffering as something that actually penetrates us. That those who are suffering in Tibet or Darfur, those who are suffering in the rainforests of South America because the forests are being cut down and their traditions are lost, this is our life as well. And when we understand interdependence, we have to also understand very simply that we have a choice on how we relate to suffering. And out of that choice, we actualize compassionate action in the world. There is someone who is greatly admired by Archbishop Tutu and His Holiness, the great Dr. Albert Schweitzer, who began his work and had his vision really as a young person. And I would like to read his words, and then I'm going to ask the panelists a question. You'll understand when you hear his words. If there is anything I have learned about men and women, and I would say young people as well, it is that there is a deeper spirit of altruism than is ever evident. Just as the rivers we see are minor compared to the underground streams, so too the idealism that is visible is minor compared to what people carry in their hearts unreleased or scarcely released. Humankind is waiting, is longing for those who have accomplished the task of untying what is knotted and bringing these underground waters to the surface. That has been the purpose of these days that we have spent together. It is the purpose of today. So I would like to ask each panelist, going to Essence, beginning with you, Uriah. Hey, Uriah. And then I'm going to introduce the panelists, because let's know them not through their visible identities in terms of their publications or I'm a so-and-so, but I'd like them to speak. What was it, Uriah, and for those of us who are no longer Uriah's age, what was it that has broken open in our childhood, in our youth, that turned our hearts toward compassion? So can we begin with you, Uriah? Okay, well, I guess it is knowing that you're privileged and you want to be able to help others without wanting a reward back for it. Thank you so much. And Jasmine, what turned you toward compassion? What specific incident when you were young broke open that river of compassion for you? I think uh, in our life, we come across a number of individuals who affect us. And there is one person who comes to my mind. Uh, you know, it, it's a gentleman in India, Bhagat Puran Singh, who spent all his life taking care of people who were crippled. 
he would pick them up on his shoulders and take them to a place where he would heal them. And his whole thing was, God helps those who can help themselves. But what do we do with people who can't help themselves? And to me, I think that went to the core of the issue. If we can have empathy for the people around us and not kind of look for anything more than that, then I think we cut through all the other things around us. Thank you, Jasmine. Sister Rajaprana, it was the words of the Indian saint Sarada Devi, a very simple woman who simply said, don't find faults in others if you wish to have peace of mind. Mm. The whole world is your own. Don't mm. see anyone as a stranger. Thank you so much. <laughs> Beloved Rabbi. Well, I suppose the first person to teach me compassion was my mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think if one is blessed to have a wonderful mother, one is blessed mm -hmm. to be set on the path to true compassion. Just take it. Perhaps if I can think of sources that have opened up my mind, there is a very famous little Hasidic quick idiom which says, tells of how a rabbi learnt from two peasants what the real meaning of love was. When he heard one say to the other, Boris, do you love me? And the other said, of course, Ivan, I love you. He said, Boris, do you know what causes me pain? And the other said, Ivan, how can I know what causes you pain? And he said, Boris, if you do not know what causes me pain, how can you truly say you love me? Mm. Thank you, Rabbi. Archbishop Tutu and His Holiness, I'm going to ask you to go last, if you don't mind. <laughs> I know you usually go first, but um, is that okay? Okay. <laughs> Sister Joan. Well, uh, I, I learned compassion the hard way. Um, death grows a child very quickly, and my father died just before I was three years old. Uh, I remember being immersed in pain. Before I knew really what pain was, I found myself alive in it. Pain was everywhere. Pain was in his family and her family and his friends and in my 21-year-old mother. And suddenly, at the age of three, I had a feeling of phenomenal responsibility for that pain. I was the only one in the room who knew yet how to giggle and make other people giggle. I was the only one who could go up and say, I'm sorry, and they'd laugh while they cried. In the middle of it, I learned that life was very fragile, and I was responsible for a lot of it, and yet, as an only child, I didn't feel alone. I had a great sense of connection to the universe that my mother told me was God. So I decided after that, God and I would do it together. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Joan. Dr. Matson. Well, my, my parents um, made a deliberate move of their six and then seven children from a suburb in the early 1960s to an inner city uh, uh, community because they wanted us to appreciate what we had and to live with other families who didn't have the advantages that we had. What's interesting is that even when you come to a community and try to be among them, still knowing that you can leave, means that you have some advantage. And I remember very clearly when I was in kindergarten, at the end of the year, the last day of kindergarten, my beloved teacher named me Girl of the Year and uh, handed me a certificate and then this beautiful flower, this creamy ivory and, and purple flower. It just smelled beautiful. It was lovely. It was like a bowl. It was so big. And I walked outside with it, and I was, I was so happy. And then another girl in the class, I'll call her D for now, grabbed that flower, 
threw it on the ground and stamped it and said, what makes you so much better than the rest of us? Mm. And I remember that until this day, feeling so sad that I was exalted and made special, and it made her feel like she had another failure. Mm. Thank you, sister. Do I call you Father Rob, Rob's, Brother Rob? Rob's fine. Rob what? Rob is fine. Okay. <laughs> uh, we won't say his last name yet. Rob. Uh, growing up, my father's uh, stepfather was very cruel to him. And in my younger years, I remember we would go visit my grandfather. And my father would do all these jobs around the house for him and would treat him with such kindness, and he was cruel to the very end, and he would say unkind and harsh things. And I remember one time challenging my dad, why are you so kind and compassionate and forgiving over and over? Why do you keep going back to his house and doing these good deeds for him when you know he's going to say those hurtful things? And, and my father said, I will love him and forgive him to the end. It's the only way. And, and at a young age, it, it, it showed me this is a better way. Thank you, Rob, so much. Ben. I think I'm ready. Um, I think I definitely have to thank my mom and my dad for instilling this want to help people. Um, one of the big things for me as a child was we used to have about a dozen chickens in our backyard, and it was always my job to feed the chickens. And, um, so from a really young age, I was taught that it's important to care for other things. And then being able to walk out with that feed bag in the backyard and feed these chickens, they needed me. And that's how I feel now, is that it's really important to help other people because it's, it's such a necessity. Oh, thank you, Ben. I thought not what people were saying. Just briefly, I was blind between the age of four and six. And a woman took care of me whose mother had been a slave. And that woman had a taste of freedom in her that I've encountered in no one. And I feel so grateful for how she cared for me. And I think it, that experience turned my heart toward, toward the world. Archbishop Tutu. What happened when you were a kid that lit you up and broke your heart open yes. to this world? <laughs> Thank you very much, yes. I, I was telling people, I, I feel a little bit like Michael Jackson with this thing around me here. <laughs> Well, in addition to that, Archbishop Tutu. <laughs> <laughs> in addition to that. Yes, just I, give I us a data in, point uh, for all these young people. <laughs> <laughs> now you can be compassionate with Michael Jackson. <laughs> I don't know how he'd do in that outfit. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. No. I, uh, I was going to copy you and, and, and say my mother, which is true. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll let I'm you be. Copying me. I'm always copying me. <laughs> Thank you. But no, let me. One of the most wonderful people who touched my life was an Anglican priest. Trevor Huddleston, who came from England to Sophia Town in near Johannesburg, and made a ghetto urchin like me feel so important and special. I was in hospital for 20 months with TB. And this white man, this important white man, 
used to come and visit me in hospital mm. at least once a week. And I've always wanted to emulate him. Thank you, Thank Archbishop. God. Your Holiness. <laughs> yes, you. <laughs> uh, I think. Uh, I think nothing special, but I think, uh, Rabbi, as I mentioned, I think I think uh, everybody is. I think a real teacher uh, of compassion or love is one's own mother. There's no doubt. And if anyone who lacks that kind of sort of affection, then I think later, even difficult circumstances, it may not develop easily sense of concern about other. So therefore, I think the seed uh, of the sense of concern or affection, I think most important is the early period, uh, uh, the, I said the maximum care from our mother that I, I feel a real teacher. My own case, certainly. My mother, very, very kind. Although uneducated, just village mother, simple farmer. Simple farmer. So very, very kind. Not only it was her own children, but those her other people who facing with difficulties, my mother's sort of reaction. As soon as seeing these, I said, a difficult people, especially difficult children, she always uh, helped them, and sometimes. Even if she cannot help herself crying, remember like that. That's how I feel. Thank you so much, Your Holiness. <laughs> I mean, clearly, from what we've heard, it is um, kindness, compassion, altruism is aroused through our experience of relationship and also suffering and our relationship to suffering. And this panel is here to address issues of suffering. You know, I have um, these long introductions for these remarkable people. I don't think I should do them. No. They can read them on the website. Okay. Yes. <laughs> they can read them on the website. Yeah. Read it on the website. We're just going to stand in our little shoes and speak our hearts. And um, so. So out of this, what I'd like to do is in invite us just to a few seconds of silence. And in the spirit of our friends here addressing issues related to altruism and compassion, to um, be present for a nation, a region, a city, a neighborhood, a family, a community, an individual who is suffering. And we'll just take a few seconds, but take in their suffering. Really take it in. And on your exhalation, send mercy and healing for that being or those beings. Most particularly, I think most of us will be resting with Tibet and Tibetans at this time. We'll take just a few seconds. Take in that suffering and send mercy on your out breath.
Thank you. And letting that sensibility rest within the background of your mind, I now am going to ask our youth ambassadors, our Seeds of Compassion youth ambassadors, to pose their questions. And I will choose panelists to address these questions. Tanya. Tanya is from Iran. And um, uh, I'm going to ask if you will bring the first question forward. So the first question is going to be, does the first step towards compassion start internally or externally? Sister Joan, will you take that one, please? Yes, does the, the question first, is, did the you question get is, does the first step toward compassion start internally or externally? And the answer is yes. <laughs> Uh, compassion, if, if you look into your own heart, you know is a process. It, it begins in example. I, I, I still have an image of my mother when I was about five, looking out a window into a rainstorm, seeing a young boy about the age of these panelists hiding in the bushes. The boy had run away from an orphanage in the area, uh, a kind of a detention home in those days. He, she took that child in. Uh, uh, this stranger into our house, a big boy who frightened me. She fed him, uh, she gave him my father's clothes. She called the home and said, I want this boy to be able to visit here any way he wants to. And then, then the second step after example then has got to be engagement. Uh, we, begin, uh, uh, we begin to help children bury birds and feed stray dogs and pet stray cats. And eventually, for me, in second grade, sister told us there were babies in China that were starving. If, if you've ever gone to a Catholic school, you've adopted a Chinese baby. <laughs> okay, sister. And I had to give my nickel every day, and then my mother matched it. The point is that the example and engagement lead to investment. The education of a child in compassion begins with the adults in this room. Ask yourself, for what do you weep? And you'll know what will happen to your children. Yes. Thank you. Is a person's heart a mirror of their capacity to manifest compassion on others? Jasmine Singh, will you respond to that? I think when you look at compassion, you don't look at compassion in its isolation. Um, compassion is sort of contagious. You know, when you put it out there, how do you put it out there first, right? The first thing is to recognize that the same light exists in each one of us. And once you've recognized that, then it becomes easy. Because then you, as you love yourself, as you love your own uh, children, as you love your parents, you get to recognize the same value and empathize with everybody around you. And so the heart automatically connects with that aspect of compassion. If you can connect with other individuals at that basic level, then, then the heart and the mind actually does come together. It's not just about, you know, having the feeling of pity, but it's actually having the uh, courage and the strength to actually be able to connect the love and affection together for a person's situation, to recognize their pain and suffering and sort of feel the same pain and suffering like, uh, like you had indicated in the beginning. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Jasmine Singh. Tanya is going to ask the third part of her question. How can any individual connect their heart to their brain and learn to seek love towards themselves? Dr. Matson, you take that question. I don't hear well. Beginning with the heart is essential because we, we need to care first. If we don't care about the suffering of others, then we're not going to take the time and do the hard work that it takes to understand what the cause of that is. 
because understanding the cause and then figuring out realistic, effective strategies for resolving some of the systematic injustice that leads to that suffering can be boring. You know, we can't simply go on the, the feeling compassionate, feeling the pain of others has a certain um, uh, reward in itself, the emotional reward, but the organizational, institutional, hard, boring work, as Rob knows, pastor of a big church, to do the fundraising, to sit in the board meetings, to make those programs, that's, that's not as exciting, but it's necessary if we're going to be serious about our compassion. Thank you so much, Dr. Matt. So I want to congratulate the panelists for their conciseness. And I'm actually going to make a request from the audience. I know you all want to clap, but um, also I'm just a little concerned that the clapping might wick up valuable time. Is it okay unless you're just overwhelmed? <laughs> Is that all right? Whistling. <laughs> I feel like clapping too, but. Um, Otieno. Hey, Otieno is from Seattle, and he's got a great question. How can one learn to overcome the anger they hold inside? What is the best method to doing so? How can we overcome our anger? And what's the best method? Otieno, Otieno asks, and Uriah, would you touch into that? Uriah, by the way, is, uh, I hate to say this, 12 years old. Mm -hmm. and is a born altruist mm -hmm. engaged in many good works. So I shouldn't have told everybody what you do. You can stand <laughs> in your own shoes. But anyway, go for it, Uriah. Okay, so I think, um, well, from my Christian belief that you should pray, and then also, in general, you could do, like, writing to express yourself so you don't feel, so you don't hold it in because it's not natural and you need to find some way to express yourself if it's in writing or song or prayer or maybe even just talking to someone that you trust. Uriah, thank you so much. They're going to cry anyways. It's <laughs> hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm um, watching His Holiness over these days uh, with so much equanimity and also knowing how um, he would like things to be otherwise in Tibet. And he's often spoken about anger in his talks and he's written about anger. I think that uh, young people here um, would benefit greatly if you give us some guidance, Your Holiness, and how you work on transforming anger within your own situation. Anger, I think one of the thousands of different mental emotions or mental states. The, huh? mental states. So firstly, uh, of course, uh, now here I think I'm Buddhist. So my approach, of course, according to Buddhist mm -hmm. tradition, mm -hmm. The, uh, firstly, they recognize the importance of mental factor. Then, to know a variety of different sort of minds, different thoughts, different emotions. Mm. Then, uh, important to know what kind of emotion uh, is good or bad under certain certain circumstances. Uh, then important is like external thing, the mental sort of uh, level also. The uh, it is very important to know the distinctions. Uh, know 
contradictory forces. forces. Mm -hmm. So in order to reduce one emotion, you have to find the contradictory sort of emotion. Then in order to reduce this, you must cultivate or increase the other counter force. And then also the uh, all sort of difference on mental, uh, uh, mental factor, again interdependent. So it depends on other mental factor. So that's gen generally Buddhist sort of way of uh, the training and way of approach. So sometimes successful, sometimes not very successful. <laughs> then what to do? <laughs> Thank you so much, Your Holiness. We'd like to give you an A. You know, in America, we grade people uh, for their work. Uh, you've done a very uh, excellent job this week in um, keeping your anger in a transforming state, uh, turning it into compassion. So we give you an A. And as His Holiness said, it's not always success that we meet. So um, Josh from Seattle has a question about this, when we fail. <clears throat> How can uh, you or an individual learn to not be so hard on yourself? And what I mean by that is, how do you learn to redeem yourself for a mistake or something like you're doing all these compassionate acts and you have one slip up, how can you learn to overcome? Okay, Josh, I lost the second part of your question, so maybe you can um, say it just a little slower. I know the first part is, how do you learn not to be so hard on yourself? The second part? Um, what I meant. Great. That's better. <laughs> what I meant by that was uh, that how, if you make one mistake, how do you learn to overcome that inside and continue being a compassionate person? Oh, okay. Thanks, Josh. Ben, can you reflect on that for us? Sure. I think that um, I think when people are feeling down, they need to get out there and talk to somebody else and take a minute to talk to the people around them and realize that. Only, full, only through talking to the people around you do you realize your own meaning. Um, and only can you find the true value of yourself when you realize your place in your own community. And <clears throat> I think people just need to take a deep breath and realize that life is not always about you. Just take a step back. Excuse me, I think we better <laughs> applaud. <laughs> I don't know. I, try, I can't take, take, it, take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. In it. Rob, would you reflect on that question? That was a wonderful answer, but I, yes. I'd love to hear your perspective. I, th I think that many people uh, are pick up along the way that life is about destination. So they're taught it's about arriving. It's about having all the answers. It's about creating a nice box that you sit in and defend. B but my fundamental understanding is that life is journey. A and journey is a fundamentally different way to understand life than destination. Yeah. And on a journey, right. all I have, am responsible for is the next step. And, and that's all I'm ever asked for is the next step. Huh. I don't have to have it all figured out. I don't have to defend it all. I don't have to have it all nailed down. And, and if you can shift from destination understanding yep. to, and to, to journey, yep. it frees you to take life as it comes, let it be what it is, and then do the next right thing. Hey, Rob, thank you so much. Archbishop Tutu. Okay. Yes. <laughs> How can you learn, asks Josh, not to be so hard on yourself when you fail, when you let people down? I, I can't hear properly. Um, I'm not as young as I look. We're not <laughs> I didn't that, hear you either just now. Right. He's not as young as he looks. <laughs> what did he say? I'm not. <laughs> did you catch what he said? I didn't know. I don't know what he I'm, said. I'm not as young as I look. Oh, all right. Good. 
Rabbi Rosen, could you repeat the question for uh, the Archbishop? What do you answer to Josh about not being too hard on yourself when you make a mistake and how to be able to move on? That's because I, I speak South African, you understood me. <laughs> Thank you so very much for your understanding. Yes. You know what? Just going back to the thing about anger. We've forgotten, in fact, I mean, that it would be awful if we didn't get angry when you see someone for instance, violating a child. Yeah. That would be awful. Yeah. And, and so it is something to be thankful for when you, you, you lose your cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, I mean, that, that, is that, is, that is quite important. It says something about it, because if you were to be indifferent, having heard that children are being killed, say, in Tafor. I, I would get worried about, about you. And so I'm glad that you get upset. And about the things that actually get to upset you, I get very angry with God. Mm. I mean, I've... I've <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, how can you, how can you let this, that, and the other happen, you know? Uh, you got it. And, and the God that we, we worship is incredible in a way. It says, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, I... I gave them a gift of freedom, and they can use it that way. And I can't do, <laughs> I can't do anything, you know. Uh, okay, get, get mad at me, you know, get mad at me. I'm glad you're getting mad. And sometimes, you know, I laugh easily, but I cry quite a lot as well. And so I cry. But I, I want to support you in, for goodness sake, God has all of eternity to work on you. You know? I mean, you, you and I are a work in progress, you know. And, and if, we, if we sleep, this is the one of the wonderful things about God. God doesn't say when you, when you, when you make a mistake, ah, good riddance to bad rubbish. <laughs> no. Good riddance to... No. God, God picks you up, dusts you off, and says, try again. And when you mess it up again, God says, tough luck. <laughs> tough. Come on, let's try again. Yeah. Dust you off. Just, come on, try. Try and try. Because this God, they say, is a three miles per hour God <laughs> walking at our pace. Thank you, Archbishop. <laughs>